You're listening to Speaking Sidemount, the podcast where we talk all things sidemount diving, from equipment, skills, techniques, and sidemount diving expeditions, to interviews with some of the world's top sidemount divers. Whether you're new to sidemount, been sidemount diving for years, or just want to know more, this is the place for all things sidemount. I'm your host, Steve Davis. Let's get wet. Hey, welcome back to Speaking Sidemount. I'm Steve Davis. This episode is brought to you with the support of our amazing sponsor, XDeep. As you know, I'm a massive fan of XDeep, their team, products, their support of this podcast, and many amazing explorers from around the world, and of course, their foundation, which is innovation. You'd have to be living under a rock if you're not across their trickle release of the new NX700 regulators. Being on the other side of the planet, I haven't managed to get my hands on a set yet, but they're coming, and I'll be on them as soon as I can rip them from our local dealer's grasp. Andrew, you are on notice. Thanks also to all of our patrons who selflessly support this show and help to make the production possible. Late last year, I was honoured to be invited to speak at the Flow Sidemount event in Kalaganona, Sardinia. The event was originally slated for June of this year, but has been moved to October due to COVID. Conceived and organised by Stratus Cast, my guest way back in episode 38, along with Danielle Pontus and Mariona Yepes W from Blueforia Dive Centre, this event will be a must attend for Sidemount divers based in Europe and the UK, and definitely also for anyone wishing and able to attend from other parts of the world given COVID travel restrictions. Now you may remember I travelled to Sardinia back in 2019 and caught up with Thorsten Toddy Velder and Brian Starnes for some brilliant cave diving. So I can recommend Kalaganona from personal experience as a top cave diving destination and an awesome place to visit. Now to our knowledge this is the first side mount specialist event in Europe and it's intended to cover the full gambit of side mount from recreational diving open water through to tech diving in open water wrecks and of course caves. Kalaganona Sardinia is an absolute ideal location for such an event and it's no surprise that XDeep are on board to support the event. Speakers include, and I'm really sorry if I miss anyone out, but I can't wait to meet and learn from former guests on Speaking Sidemount including Gary Dallas, Mikko Parsi and Christina Zanato. Add to that amazing list the man who actually coined the term technical diving, Michael Menduno, and TV personality, author and explorer, Andy Torbett. So with Flo Sardinia in front of me, I thought it would be a great opportunity to catch up with Danielle Pontus to learn more about his diving, about Blueforia Dive Centre, how he set it up and the diving that they do, his philosophy teaching sidemount diving, and then given Danielle is an instructor trainer on the Kiss Sidewinder, I asked him more about this amazing sidemount CCR, including, somewhat selfishly for me, the transition from open water air diluent level to cave CCR and normoxic trimix. Danielle and I both feature in Stratus Cass's book Close Call, so I asked Danielle to relive his near miss and share what he learned and how he applies this in his own diving and interactions with his students on courses. And of course we talk about flow and what you can expect if you come and meet us and attend this event. Now before we get into this episode, I want to pass on my thanks and appreciation to Danielle. Now he's Italian and his English is not strong. He's also a little shy and generally would not do an interview like this. He agreed because I asked him, and I'm very grateful to him for his efforts. As you'll hear, he certainly was able to get his message across, and let's be clear, his English is a hell of a lot better than my Italian, or any other language for that matter. Cheers to you Danielle, I definitely owe you a beer or two. And we are recording. Danielle, welcome to Speaking Sidemount. Thank you for inviting me, Steve. You're most welcome. Now, just to get us started so we can get a bit of context to everything we're going to talk about, can you give me a little bit of your background and how you got into diving? My first dive was in 1998. It was a long time ago. After I followed my diving career just uh, as a recreation and, uh, and a diver, I was working for a very known fashion brand. As a manager, okay, and my first job was absolutely far from diving industry. And uh, slowly, slowly, I changed completely my approach to the life. And uh, I changed my life choosing to get only in diving 
world uh, industry and um, I spent time training myself at the beginning as a recreational instructor and uh, after as technical diver and then I discovered the sidemark configuration I was absolutely fascinated and it was really funny how I start because I tried to build my own harness. <laughs> <laughs> and, many, many people have tried that before you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, uh, but it was absolutely funny because I tried to, to build my harness um, using a backmount BCD recreation of wrapping with a bungee and that was absolutely crazy and super, super funny. Yes. I was spending time in the pool training uh, with absolutely crazy equipment and it was impossible to find a way mm -hmm. that I decided to get in a class and then buy one harness, mm -hmm. yes. What was it about side mount diving that excited you or that got you to want to dive in that way? Why? Because uh, for me, it was uh, obvious, the better comfort, uh, the hydrodynamic uh, solutions, uh, mm -hmm. the very easy configuration, how to carry the tanks on the dive spot. Absolutely, for me, was obvious, okay, the side mount uh, was much more comfortable for me uh, than back mount, for sure, mm -hmm. for sure. But in the, in the same period, I was working in a diving shop in South Sardinia and I was working in um, the spots are really, really deep. And uh, I worked for this shop uh, for two years, three years, mm -hmm. more or less, but in the deep wrecks, really deep. The first wreck uh, was at minimum 80 meters. Um, the maximum that was 180 meters and mm -hmm. was absolutely complicated for me. Be focused on diving inside mount and improve my skills. Was sure. absolutely impossible. After I worked for Sardinia government, training a class of guys, 20 guys become guides, tourist guides with the dive master certification. And uh, I discovered Calagonone here in Sardinia. And mm -hmm. absolutely amazing place. Absolutely amazing place. It's like this than I'm for Cape Davis. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I had the great pleasure to come to your country and to Calaganona in uh, 2019. Unfortunately, we didn't meet, but I had such an amazing time. I enjoyed the place, the town, the food, yeah. the people were amazing. And you're right, the diving is spectacular. I do want to get onto that because the caves of Sardinia are quite a bit different to caves in other parts of the yeah. world. Very different to Mexico, very different to Florida. What is it in your mind that makes the caves of Sardinia special? But it makes special first because the, it's a, a kind of marine caves connected to the mountain caves, 90% of the cases. And uh, there's alokline in a, a marine cave uh, from the entrance and sometimes to one third of the penetration. They are very different. Uh, in every cave, you can find uh, two, three different scenarios. Okay? You can find the first part for uh, the cavern side and you think, okay, this cave is more or less, I can understand more or less how is this cave. But after 100 meters start to change and change and change and change continuously. And uh, is it unbelievable uh, for us, especially because Sardinia Island is built with different geological materials. Okay? Mm -hmm. And here start the uh, limestone. Only in this side is very important, the limestone caves. There's different places. In Sardinia, you can find some little cave, but not as Caragonone. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, too, it's very difficult to find a, a system as Buemarino, for example, has 75 kilometers of connections with dry caves and uh, underwater caves. It's unbelievable. Yes, unbelievable. Uh, yeah. A lot of fun here. You can uh, have 10 life here, and you spend 10 life uh, diving in Sardinia, and uh, for sure, <laughs> you will never get bored about Indeed. Yeah, that was one of the things that surprised me because I've seen Halocline plenty of times in Mexico, but the sheer extent of it and how long it goes into the cave. I mean, you can dive an hour into a cave and still be in a Halocline and experience that. Yeah, I remember one, and I can't remember the name of the cave. It really annoys me now that I've forgotten, but there was a massive hydrogen sulfide layer for a long, long period as well. You might know it by that. And then as you hit the fresh water, it broke into this beautiful cave system. Amazing. I just loved it so much. And of course, the formations, because many of them have been dry or have dry sections in them. So you have formations, helicytes and so on. And it was very, very impressive. Yeah, we have more than one system is dry connections. Cala Luna, F, Bentorrente, Buemarino, there's Delfico, 
here mm. it's a very very special place to open a shop and i decided to open a shop exactly here i'm Why from we... south sardinia I'm, I'm far from home yeah far from home you're a few hours drive yeah yeah <laughs> yeah three hours far from home but it was the place for me that's just a weekend dive trip for us now before we get on too far I know there's a fair bit of open water and wreck diving in the area as well. Do you get involved very yeah. much in that or do you exclusively dive caves? No, 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 no. The technical crew and the recreational crew at my shop. Mm-hmm. Uh, two, three guys work only in the recreational side, try to use uh, the, our approach, the, our uh, philosophy in the recreational mm-hmm. too. I opened my diving shop because I put more attention on uh, um, the comfort, uh, how to teach my students to know and discover their own body and their own potential. And uh, mm-hmm. I was trying to evolve uh, one my philosophy because it was necessary for me to dive in a better way. And I mm-hmm. tried to put this on my way to teaching and uh, my students, they appreciate and um, mm-hmm. my staff too. We have three wrecks here in Caragonone. One is a uh, Probably one of the best wreck in the Mediterranean Sea is the Ugo Bassi. It's, it's not really deep. It's 90 meters maximum depth. And uh, mm-hmm. it's amazing. It's 120 meters length. And uh, mm-hmm. it's very, very good state of conservation. Awesome. Uh, the other one is a recreational shipwreck. It's a KT12, the Nazi shipwreck. The other one is Italian shipwreck. Really shallow dives. And cave diving, of course. Now, with Blue Foria, so you established this dive center some years ago now. I think it was more than five years ago? No, it was seven years ago. Seven years ago. And you mentioned that you wanted to set it up with this very specific philosophy around the way that you taught divers. Tell us a little bit about the focus of Blue Foria and what you're looking to bring to divers when they come to you. Uh, yeah, for me, it's very important to understand first who is in front of me. I have to understand that my students are because every student is different i have to approach in a different way every student and i try to teach them how to use their own body their own mind how to discover the potential they have and to control the muscles for example i want to define my approach holistic mm-hmm. i think to improve the comfort is much better for my students because i can see them after they reach a comfort a very good comfort they can do what i'm asking them to do yeah before they can't they can uh, do something uh, similar what i want from them but it's not what i want and first they have to know what they can do they have to discover their own potential and um, mm-hmm. after they have to uh, know turn on and turn off mm-hmm. in there okay depends what they yeah. want to do but in a in every situation, for me, it's very important to know who they are. And one important thing in technical diving I try to teach is the ego control. They have to control yes. their own ego. Yeah, it's big. It's and we'll talk about that a bit later, I think, when we get on to Stratus Castle's book, Close Calls. I want to ask you a lot yeah. about that. And of course, what you're talking about with comfort blends really well with side mount instruction, doesn't it? Because I know myself with my students, one of the things I'm trying to do is to do exactly what you said, which is to get them comfortable in the water. And once they're comfortable, they're balanced, they're stable, and then they become a platform that you can build skills on. And so you can then help them to not only develop skills in side mount, but then to take those skills into different environments like shipwrecks and caves and so on. So I'm sure we share a very common philosophy there. I know, especially in the early days, I'm sure you still do, you've done a lot of exploration of your local caves there. Can you tell us a little bit about your own diving in your local area there in Calagonona? Uh, the, in Calagonona, we spent not too much time uh, uh, on the exploration. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. uh, when uh, we start, the challenge was uh, absolutely really, very really hard for me. And mm-hmm. the hill was wow. And um, we spent a lot of time uh, focus on the to know the territory and uh, to understand what we can organize for our students, how to promote ourselves, we start to check for uh, some exploration only two years ago, uh, mm-hmm. me and my staff. And uh, you know, we're close to, not new probably, but for us, yes, new passages, uh, new, we have a lot of projects, but nothing now is start, really start. We have to plan better. I prefer to talk in the future about this. 
Yeah. So what you're really saying is you spent a lot of time discovering the caves for yourselves and learning them yeah. so that you could dive them yourself, but also take students into the caves and use them as teaching environments and as guiding environments. Yeah. Yeah. We spent time at the beginning to know the caves because we have to know where we are going to bring mm -hmm. the, the students. And it uh, was complicated at the beginning uh, because for me, I was alone opening uh, my shop and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was really complicated. And uh, I had only the option to solo dive at the first time and uh, for mm -hmm. the first two years and uh, was complicated, was really complicated. So clearly the pandemic has had a really, really big impact on all of us around the world. And we can only hope the situation improves. You've mentioned you've just been vaccinated and I'm due to very soon. Can you tell us a little bit about the impact on you locally there and how you're doing now in terms of coming out of the pandemic? Uh, yeah, the pandemic here destroyed completely at the beginning, uh, immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, when the pandemic started, destroyed completely the tourist uh, situation in Sardinia. Sardinia, how you can see uh, the map, is a very central island in the Mediterranean Sea and is a destination for every part in the world. We have tourism from every part in the world especially from Europe, of course, but from every part in the world. The sea yes. is amazing. And they, everyone know the Sea of Sardinia is like Caribbean Sea, like Maldives Sea. It's a really, really, really uh, unbelievable. But the pandemic stopped completely the tourism. And the situation here was co really complicated. Not about the contamination of the, in Sardinia, because the, our index is 0.3. We are really close to be COVID free. And mm -hmm. this is not a problem because in the island, the island is bigger. We are just 1,600,000. We are not too much. But uh, without tourism, we cannot survive. And uh, <laughs> it was complicated to get in uh, because it was 14 days of quarantine sure. plus or test, uh, two, three tests. It was impossible. Now, slowly, 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 we are starting to see uh, tourists from north europe and it's very very important for us absolutely mm. very important we are positive and uh, we think next week probably we start the season we are yeah absolutely which is positive. awesome coming into your summer as well which is really vitally important right it really starts to kick off i imagine from june and we're here in mid to late may right now look i agree i have many many friends spread around the world who've all been seriously impacted and we have here in New Zealand to some degree as well, although we've been extremely lucky, but wish you really well coming out of it. And I wish you a great season. And I think given that the vaccines are coming now and for anyone who's out there listening, who's vaccinated and ready to travel, then I can only say that Sardinia is one of the very, very best places that I've been to dive and Culloganona itself is a spectacular place to visit in every respect yeah. in terms of the town itself. On top of that, the ocean or well, the sea there is so beautiful, so clear. Uh, the water in the summer is particularly warm as well. So it's a very, very nice. And then being able to dive there and access the caves from the ocean is just something so different. And uh, yeah, I did a little bit of that in Malta, but Malta doesn't have the same caves as Sardinia. So being able to then go and, and do several hours of cave diving, having access from a boat and going through all the different environments itself is just something incredible. And as I said, I thoroughly enjoyed it and looking forward to coming back. We'll talk about that a bit later. So let's move on a bit. So we talked a little bit about side mount diving. And as you um, probably know, I did some training nearly two years ago now with Ed Sorensen in Mariana, Florida on the Sidewinder. Yeah. I wanted to chat to you a bit. And again, for entirely selfish reasons, you're an instructor trainer on the Sidewinder. Can you share a few of your thoughts where it shines, perhaps any limitations you see with it? And then there's a massive amount of interest in the Sidewinder. So where do you think it's going to go in the future? There's three questions there. So let's start out with what do you love about that unit? Why have you become an instructor trainer? What do you like about it? Yeah, well, for me, that's not something, the best unit around now. For me, I don't see limitation on, on the unit, honestly, because for the way I teach, the way I dive, the unit for me is absolutely perfect it's perfect mm -hmm. to travel uh, it's perfect uh, to wear uh, it's super light it's super reliable okay i start to dive with the sidewinder first and after i absolutely i love from the first time on my x-deep harness is perfect 
It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Just I don't have to change nothing. The harness is perfect to die. And the unit too. Uh, less weight on my back, streamlined, absolutely reliable. And um, I love it. I love it since the beginning. And uh, especially because during some cave, the right side of the cave was for me not really difficult to carry that, the unit on my back mm. and uh, mm. jump and from the dry caves to the wet caves. Yeah. The unit is easy to understand. Uh, it's very simple. And uh, the students love it. I think you love your side wonder unit and you start to love from the beginning because it's very, very easy. It's very comfortable. The work of breath is amazing. I can define the unit now. Mike was genial to invent this unit and it's as simple as fantastic. Yeah, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there, right? It's a very simple, easy to understand and easy to train on unit when you're starting out and rebreather diving. And one of the things, as I've said a few times, that I love the most is what you mentioned as well, where it laid completely on top of my side mount setup. I'd done many, many hundreds of side mount dives by the time I'd started the training, probably nearly eight years and all around the world, different environments. So it was extremely comfortable side mount diving open circuit. And then going to rebreathers for me was something I wasn't going to do because I didn't really want to put something on my back and go through that whole back mount rebreather thing yeah. so the fact that the sidewinder came along and the first guy who really mentioned it to me was michael thomas from the cave diving group and he mentioned what you said which was he uses the sidewinder when he needs to go dry caving and he needs a rebreather that he can take out of the water walk through a dry cave passage that's light enough and easy enough for him to handle that you can use smaller cylinders with as well and then be able to go back in the water and easily put it all back on and hit the water again. And so that excited me a little bit. And then talking to the likes of Ed Sorensen, of course, and Christina Zanato and many others who are side mount diving with the Sidewinder around the world, it just started to really capture me. And so it wasn't a hard decision in the end to go and train with Ed. And what really shocked me was how quickly I fell back into trim, how quickly exactly. I felt comfortable. Of course, it's different. The whole feeling of driving the gas around the loop is different to open circuit where you're being delivered gas but once you're comfortable with that once you understand how to control your buoyancy which for me was just a lot of swimming around and just getting used to the unit once i did that in the end Ed and i did some incredible diving on that unit that would have been pretty much at the limit of my open circuit capability and i'd only been on the unit for 20 hours or something at that time so a couple of hypotheticals for you. If somebody was to come to you for side winder training, what would your expectations be in terms of their diving and skill level when they came to you? Yeah, okay. The expectation is uh, absolutely they have to be uh, really good trained uh, divers and expert mm -hmm. divers on the side mount certification for sure. And the first day we spent all the day of the course. I teach in seven days. I don't like to teach in three, four days. I prefer to teach in a one week because the first day I have to go diving in open circuit with the diver and I have to check everything they can and they cannot do it. Mm -hmm. I want to just do a check dive about the level. After we start to talk about their own uh, notions and skills and uh, mm -hmm. this, just the second day we start with the theory and uh, to talk about the unit, of course. I expect from them uh, they have to be perfectly in open circuit configuration and after they can jump in the class, of course. Sometimes I refused completely the student because yep. uh, I think folk was not time to them uh, to get in the class for the CCI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a really fair point. Look, I agree completely with that. If you want to go to rebreather diving and you're a side mount diver, and that's what this podcast is all about, right? So we're speaking to side mount divers. I think from my own experience and from what I've seen and from what you're telling me, you need to have dialed in your open circuit side mount skills and have done a lot of diving and side mount to basically build a platform that is good enough for you to move on to the next level of diving with rebreathers. I think that's really what you were saying, wasn't it? Exactly, yeah. If they are not ready, we can work together and we can mm -hmm. uh, add days to the course, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it's really necessary to be stable. I want to see a confident divers with the configuration. Because they have to know the configuration, the bailout, as you know, the first bailout is the open circuit, okay? And they have to know. Uh, I start to teach them in open water. I don't teach in the caves and the caverns. Mm -hmm. I 
first to teach them in open water and I want to see them growing slowly, 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 slowly. Yep. And uh, I'm dedicated years to try to find a way to teach. And uh, now I have, and I want to stay on this way because I love to see my students have my time and me on them uh, in an exclusive way for one, two weeks. And after, yes, of course, we build a, a different relation and uh, we become friends and uh, for everything I'm there for them. And uh, I have very good relationship with my students, yes, still. Yeah, and that's really important, isn't it? And so I'd throw this out as another hypothetical, but I'm talking about myself, of course. So just so that's really clear. So I'm sidewinder trained now. I'm already a full cave diver. I'm a tri okay. diver, open circuit. I'm a technical side mount okay. instructor, and I've done over 100 hours now on the sidewinder. So I feel I'm ready now to take the sidewinder cave diving, and that's really what my goal is. So if I come to you and I want to hmm. do the cave CCR and normoxic trimix on the sidewinder, how do you put those courses together? Yeah, you can get in a class, of course. If you are already a full cave diver in open circuit, if you are a, already a very expert CCR diver, of course, uh, it's mm -hmm. perfect for me. I think this is the way how to reach the CCR cave diver. Mm -hmm. Your experience in open circuit, you have to do your experience in CCR in open water and only after getting mm -hmm. a CCR cave. The course uh, is an amazing course and uh, is a very, very interesting course, absolutely. To do a course like this, I love to stay with my students, with my class, more or less 12 days dedicated mm -hmm. to them. Yep. So for the Normoxic Trimix course on the Sidewinder, what's the requirements in terms of carrying bailouts and skills and so on? The, the bailout with the Sidewinder is very, very easy to set up, as you know, because the difference between the Sidewinder and the Sidewinder Tree Breeder is you already have to thanks your respect, your open secret certification. And... Uh, Diving in sidemount in uh, open circuit in streamix uh, uh, is more or less the same configuration of the open circuit. Absolutely mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. You have to configure it yourself in the same number of bottles and the same way you configure yourself for the open circuit normal circuit streamix course. How we set up the course? We do as usual the open circuit check absolutely and uh, about the notion we we spend one two days with the student. And uh, they have to be certificated with uh, decompression procedures and uh, advanced nitrox uh, and be really, really expert divers with um, their own configuration. After we start to, as I told you, the check dive in open circuit and uh, slowly, slowly we build the program uh, in CCR. We introduce the theory during the first days and uh, we spend half day in theory and half day in the sea. So you're running the Flow Sardinia side mount event in October this year. And I've got to be honest, I'm incredibly excited to see this event happen. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got it off the ground, particularly given that it happened during the pandemic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are uh, absolutely excited. I love to organize these kind of meetings. And uh, we had this uh, idea during the pandemic uh, lockdown. We were talking with my friend Stratis and with my girlfriend, Mariona, and we had this idea to think about a kind of meeting with friends and colleagues to share the experience, to share uh, what they know, they stay all together in a place like Caragonone and uh, have great food, great time, great diving. This is absolutely the first thing we want to put on flow event. Mm -hmm. Uh, is a kind of uh, a friend meeting, uh, a kind of uh, party, party no, but it's a friend meeting. It's a friend meeting. Yeah. I hope this will be only the first edition. Yes. In the first of many, of course, because I'm sure every one of you guys will love this place and will love the mood of the meeting. Yeah. Yes. Really yeah. friendly and absolutely we can share the, our experience uh, and we can uh, spend a lot of very good time, quality time together. Yeah, it's awesome. And I mean, XDeep is supporting the event. Can you share a bit about what it means to have a world-leading manufacturer like XDeep supporting this event? Um, XDeep for me is the Sidemont Harness. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, Sidemont Harness. I love the XDeep products. Uh, they, are, uh, they are super solid, super good quality. And I'm sorry, I love my Sidemont Harnesses, the Stealth Tech and the Stealth Track. Honestly, yes, and not <laughs> objective, okay? But mm -hmm. um, cannot see uh, other solution for the, the teaching incitement, absolutely, yeah. 
yep. I trust on the brand, I trust on the products, uh, and uh, I work in open circuit and in CCR configuration and uh, no problems. My harness is uh, completely, completely destroyed, but it's still working. It's just yeah. ugly, but yeah. it's still working. Nothing yeah. can say about Xdeep and uh, is amazing, amazing. And thank you for your products. Agree completely. And we both are somewhat biased. But having said that, as I started diving X deep in 2013, then I did my cave training and my side mount training, my classic harness is still hanging up in the garage. I don't use it for much. As Patrick Woodman says, it makes a really good <laughs> pillow now. Funny enough, I do dive it. I use the classic bladder as a bit of a trimming bladder when I'm diving Trimix in the tropics because it makes a really good way to bring the upper part of your body up. Plus, it gives you redundancy if you're driving a wetsuit, which is brilliant. I've talked about that before. But having said that, I dived my wreck last week with three cylinders. It was absolutely perfect, really easy. Yeah. And then I dive my tech normally when I'm diving open circuit, and then I have another tech that I use for the Sidewinder. So not that I need that many, but I'm lazy in terms of setting them up. So I like to have one set up for each type of diving that I do absolutely love it and as we've said before it's amazing to have them supporting an event like this and one thing i will say is they're incredibly supportive not only of events like this but also everyone knows they support this podcast but then they support a bunch of explorers around the world yeah exploration yeah. of wrecks and cave systems and and it just goes on and on so brilliant company to be associated with Look, in terms of this event, one thing I'm excited about, I mean, I'm coming to present, which is great, but to have people like Gary Dallas and Christina Zanato, Andy Talbot, my new friend, Mikko Parsi, who was in our last yeah. episode. And Jeffrey Glenn, too. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. And Jeff. unfortunately, we're missing out on Stratus, which is such a disappointment. You'll have to keep working on him and see if you can get him to come back. But yeah, of course, of course, we are working on it. <laughs> trying to convince him to leave his the things to do and it come up absolutely yes absolutely yes too much in um, demand that man and so look if you're listening yeah. to this and you live in europe in particular i'm going to cross the planet if i possibly can to be there but if you're in europe and you're a side mount diver then we'll have the dates and the podcast notes and some links for it this is an event that you really shouldn't miss certainly as i said the environment the the place the people and the feel of this is going to be fantastic so I'm super looking forward to it and I sincerely hope that we can all pull it off. Now, speaking of Stratus, we both featured in his book, Close Calls, and I think most yeah. of us who shared our stories have called it an honor, but to share moments in your dive career where you truly screwed up, it's a pretty sobering experience. But to be honest, I don't think this book could have been written a few years ago, and it's truly a sign that we're growing up as a technical diving community, taking safety more seriously. And knowing that by sharing close call experiences, we're actually growing and perhaps we'll be able to stop someone else making the same mistakes. Now, we mentioned a little bit before about young divers getting ahead of themselves. And I found your story in the book really compelling, I think, especially for young male divers who, in some cases, want to push their dives way beyond their experience and skill levels. And so can you recount a little bit about your story in the book and perhaps the message that you want other divers to take away from that? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Now, just to say, I introduced close calls on my classes, just using the stories of you guys mm -hmm. and mine too, if it's necessary to explain what I mean. My story is very easy. It's very easy. Uh, I was absolutely cocky and uh, absolutely uh, arrogant with the environment. I was in rush and the rush uh, cannot help in these conditions, in these things. And um, I was trying to push myself alone, diving, solo diving. For two, three years, I dove alone in the caves, just to know the environment, just to understand, and just to push myself over the limit, okay? Because I was uh, in the period stuck on the stupid uh, approach to diving. I have to show who I am. I have to show what can I do. I wasn't young, eh? but I was too young inside, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, too much ambition, in these things and uh, not respect for myself. My story, my story was uh, crazy because I, I, I break some rule and uh, uh, easy. When you break some rule, uh, sometimes you think uh, it's going everything good. Every time it's going good, but the problem is there. It's ready mm -hmm. to say you hello. My feeling inside the cave was terrible. It was terrible because, because I'm a father and I was not worried about my life. I was losing 
talking about my daughter. I cannot see my daughter anymore. I cannot uh, grow, uh, stay with her for a long time. Who will help her? This was the human side of the story. What we can lose, okay, just to be overconfidence in what we do, just to be not responsible about ourselves, just to want to push and to show to who. I don't like to show to the people what I can do, what my students can do. I, I don't teach to the students they have this kind of problems. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I stop the training to them. And uh, this is not a place to teach them if they put competition on diving. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I changed completely my approach to dive after the story, of course. Yep. And changed completely was the last stupid thing I did. Yeah. And so the mistakes you made too, I mean, clearly uh, you were overconfident and trying to prove something to the world, I guess. And I guess you were trying to find your way. And I mean, many of us have been there in different contexts where as young men or even middle-aged men, where we're moving into new careers or new whatever, you want to make your name. And so it's very easy to fall into this trap of wanting to be somewhere before you've paid your dues, if you like, in diving before you've done the dives, built the skills, built the experience and the comfort levels in the environment you're in. And so on the particular day that you had the problem reading the book, you got yourself into a very complex navigation on a very long dive. You'd laid a stage cylinder and then you'd made some mistakes, but these are mistakes that typically you would have got away with in the past, right? where you'd laid a lot of line, you hadn't kept reserve reels. And this is where you can fall into a big trap of bending the rules and getting away with it and thinking it's okay, which is normalization of deviance, which came from the space shuttle tragedy, where just because you got away with it many, many times doesn't mean it's right. But I think in the book, I read that you had a caustic partway yeah, through well, your dive. Yeah, it was not my best cocktail in the life. Eh? Absolutely. No. But no. <laughs> I was diving with my old unit and... Uh, mm-hmm pushing, 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 pushing the cave. At a certain point, uh, I tried to change position, okay? And it uh, was absolutely impossible for me to understand before the unit was leaking so bad. Yes. I arrived direct on my mouth, one glass of caustic cocktail, and it was burning me inside, burning me inside. It was absolutely painful. It was terrible for me. And... Then my mind started to be completely out of control. Mm-hmm. Completely out of control. I was painful, was worried. I started to be absolutely confused. Yeah. And uh, being alone uh, was really, really complicated to find immediately a way with the rationality. Sure. I was absolutely not rational. I went a lot of times after in this cave, of course, because I work here. And still, I asked to myself, how was possible to get lost in this cave? Mm-hmm. But trust me, it was impossible to find the exit easily. Yeah. But I don't know how. My mind uh, played a really bad game to me. I understood. I have to be uh, more sensible to this aspect with my students too, of course. Sure. And so that really leads us to the message or to what you learned from that and the changes that you made in your diving. So, I mean, you went through that event and thankfully for you and for all of us and for your daughter, you survived. And it sounds like somewhat fortuitously as well, more by luck than good fortune almost, but you found your way out, you found your stage cylinder and got out of the cave. How did your diving change after that? What did you specifically change around the way that you conducted yourself? The, absolutely the approach. I was uh, really arrogant. Okay. And uh, because I was in rush with myself, I was not so young. I was made a name of myself. I was opening a new diving shop and uh, I stopped to do this. I stopped to do this to show to the others. I'm sorry, I stopped and I said to me, I have to slowly, slowly to come back and build a program on myself to respect the rules. Uh, the message is uh, no rush. Absolutely no rush. Yeah. No rush. But quality, quality. And the diver said, don't put competition and uh, control their own ego. This is the message, yes. The ego control yeah. Yeah. could be. And uh, more consciousness is much better than what we do. Yeah, 100%. I mean, there's a few sayings there, right? The caves aren't going anywhere, are they? They're going to be there tomorrow. And if you love diving, then go for a dive tomorrow is the key 
So do what you need to do today to come out safely and so that you can go and do another dive tomorrow and enjoy the environment again and build everything up slowly, <laughs> carefully. And again, thank you for sharing or reliving that story because it's challenging, isn't it? I know my own experience. To be honest, the crazy thing about my one was now I don't even think it would scare me because I became entangled, but I couldn't free myself. And now I think it would be not such a big deal. But at that particular time, it was more of a big deal and more for just from the point of view, you know, I wasn't low on gas. So I managed to extricate myself before it got to a really critical point. And I think again, now I would deal with it in a much more methodical way. But I had several minutes of a little bit like you, where my mind went in the wrong direction. And mm. it wasn't until I got that back under control that I was able to solve the problem. Ultimately, that's really what events under the water are. They're just problems that need to be solved. And, and the yeah. only way you can solve them is by being clear. And you can avoid them for sure by following the rules. But sooner or later, something might happen anyhow. And so there's the mindset on top of the discipline of doing the right thing. Uh, yeah, of, of course, uh, something can happen because uh, you can respect all the rules. But if it happen, this is what I mean. We have to build slowly, slowly the program. On this. I prefer to do it this way. Don't do it from zero to 100 and I build slowly, slowly on my students. Then my staff too come here and I stay with me month, every season before the season to train again themselves, yes. to build slowly, slowly a solid foundation. Of course, it's very, very important for me. Yeah. I imagine places like the Med where you have definite seasons. Do you do a lot of diving through the off season or do you go overseas or do you stay in Sardinia? No, 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 no. During the winter season, I hope in, usually in the end of March and I will close end of October. And mm -hmm. during the winter, I fly away. I love Africa and uh, I spent a very beautiful time in Kenya and Tanzania trying to do some exploration. My girlfriend, Mariona, is a photographer and uh, we love Africa, yeah. Her photographs are amazing, by the way. I mean, I've seen many on Facebook, especially recently since we've become connected and they're very, very special, aren't they? And she would be happy about it. <laughs> Yeah, I've had the great fortune to talk to Laurent Moreau recently, and I've interviewed Becky Kagan Schott and a few other great photographers, and I'm going to miss a few now because there's just so many, but it really is a talent to be able to go into a cave environment, especially where the light is so low and lighting yeah. is so important and be able to take great images. It's a real talent. Yeah, I hope for her she will have a very nice career because she's super young and mm -hmm. she's really talented. I see on the screen behind you, there's lots of great images of you coming up on there too. I don't know if you set that up. Before, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's brilliant. No one will get to see that. But behind Danielle is a beautiful screen with some of Mariona's images coming up on it. So that's terrific. Yeah, well, I look forward to meeting you both. And, and look, we've gone for a wee while now, so it's been amazing. I am so excited about the opportunity to come back to Sardinia. I so hope that we can pull it off and that the pandemic eases enough and we get vaccinated and that travel is able to be done, certainly for me. I'm sure the Europeans will be able to do it. I know the event will be a huge success. And as I spoke to Mariana a couple of weeks ago, I'm excited and willing to cross the planet and come up to it. Great to talk to you. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm very excited and looking forward to, to see all of you guys here in Sardinia in October and uh, to have a very great time together. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, mate. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did making it. It was amazing to catch up with Danielle to learn more about Blueforia and, of course, about Sardinia. Talk about the flow event, which I'm just so excited to be part of. And, of course, learn a bit more about the Kiss Sidewinder graduating from air diluent levels up to Cave CCR and also Normoxic Trimix. And then, yes, we shared our stories from Close Calls. And it was great to be able to recount that, more particularly what we learned from our experiences. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you again to XDeep and the patrons of Speaking Sidemount for your support. It means so much. And to all of you, I'll look forward to catching up with you in the next episode. You've been listening to Speaking Sidemount from www.sidemountpros.com. If you'd like the podcast, please subscribe and consider leaving us a five-star review. If there's something you'd like us to cover on the show, then let us know via our Facebook page listed in the podcast notes. Thanks again, and we look forward to you joining us on our next episode of Speaking Sidemount.